to all storytellers and story lovers. My name is Laksh Tata. I host and produce the Jaipur Bites podcast, where you can hear many of the amazing sessions from the Jaipur Literature Festival. I also produce a few other podcasts, as you can see right here. English, Hindi, fiction, non-fiction. If you see something you like, maybe you can take a screenshot of this right now. I'll give you a second. And tune in later. Find them on your favorite podcast app. We're delighted to welcome you to the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Detol straight from the front lawns of Diggi Palace. It is our pleasure to present today Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. Alex Ross in conversation with Catherine Butler Shawfield. Renowned author and music critic Alex Ross's latest book Wagnerism Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music unravels the cultural history and significance of Richard Wagner and the kaleidoscopic work and life he inhabited. Ross weaves together not just Wagner's story but also the political, artistic and cultural history of the last 150 years. Ross's other books include The Rest is Noise, Listening to the 20th Century and Listen to This. In conversation with academic and author Catherine Butler Shawfield, Ross delves into the artistic genius of Wagner and the impact of art in world history. Alex Ross has been the music critic of The New Yorker since 1996. He is the author of The Rest is Noise, Listening to the 20th Century, Listen to This and Wagnerism, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. He has received a Guggenheim Fellowship and a MacArthur Fellowship. Catherine Shawfield is a historian of Hindustani music and Mughal India. In telling stories about musical lives, she writes on sovereignty and selfhood, affection and desire, sympathy and loss and power, worldly and strange. Her latest book, Music and Musicians in Late Mughal India, Histories of, of the Ephemeral 1748-1858, to will be out with Cambridge University Press in 2022. Please do remember to comment by typing it into the comment section. We now present Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. Alex Ross in conversation with Catherine Butler Shawfield. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you. And it's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be here with Alex Ross talking about his new book, Wagnerism, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. It's particularly so as uh, my own students are a big fan of his first book, The Rest is Noise, which is on all our reading lists at King's College London in the music department. And this new book is a monumental book ride through an amazing period of the 19th and 20th centuries. Richard Wagner is the colossus of music for the 19th century, born in 1813, died in 1883. It can be quite easy to forget actually how early he is in the 19th century because his music is so modern and has had such a big impact on the 20th century in particular. Uh, he's of course the uh, composer uh, and librettist and all round creator of operas, The Flying Dutchman, Tannhäuser, Lohengrin, Tristan and Isolde, The Ring Cycle, particularly his great work, Die Meistersinger and his wonderful last opera, Parsifal, which is my favorite. Um, but he's also famous and indeed notorious for his essays and his writing on music, art, religion and politics and particularly his notorious uh, negative views of Jews in music. Um, so Alex, is Ro uh, Alex Ross's book doesn't just uh, talk about this towering figure, it's really a book about Wagnerism and I'm going to get him to explain what he means by that. Um, uh, shortly, but really his impact uh, in his lifetime, um, uh, but particularly after his death. So Wagner's music, of course, you know, hit like a bolt from the blue um, into uh, Western art music, and it's had incredibly far-reaching consequences globally, um, particularly on cinema, um, the idea of the total artwork, the Gesamtkunstwerk that he developed, um, which is not unlike, in fact, the uh, Sanskrit idea of Sangeet, music, dance, drama, all wrapped up together. Um, but 
also uh, things like the light motif, the idea that you have this single musical cell that kind of runs throughout a, um, a, a large scale work like a film, um, which has even had an influence on Hindi cinema. So those cinema fans who know Dilwale Dulhani Ale Jayenge, another favorite of mine, otherwise known as DDLJ, there's a famous fragment of melody that is played by Shah Rukh Khan on the mandolin, which is a foreshadowing of the great love song of that film, Darling, on seeing you, I knew that love is crazy, which actually comes right at the end of the film, but it's foreshadowed all the way through by Shah Rukh Khan's mandolin playing. Um, so, you know, this, this, this Wagnerian melodrama coming through in music for film, even in the Hindi cinema. But of course, his influence, Wagner's influence, is much wider than that in the 20th century, particularly on art, literature, new religious movements, as I hope we're going to talk about, and of course, politics. I'm going to note in passing that uh, our most common associations with Wagner are, and his influence are, of course, with uh, the philosopher Nietzsche and with Hitler and Nazism. Um, but the really great thing about Alex's book is that it takes us on many roads less traveled in its exploration of Wagnerism. For example, Jewish Wagner, um, there were a number of Jews in Wagner's circle who defended him even after his publications. A black Wagner, feminist and gay Wagner. Um, and I just wanna quote a little bit from the end of Alex's book where he talks about how complex Wagner is as a character. And he says, these tangled histories raise bigger and tougher questions. In the face of a sacred monster like Wagner, what power do spectators have? Are we necessarily subject to the domination of his works and complicit in their ideology? Or in embracing them, can we take possession of them and remake them in our own image? Actually, that's from slightly earlier in the book, apologies, but um, but it's a really important question. Um, and reading this book, um, it's so rich and um, it's like living with Wagner and inside Wagner, but also inside those people who spun out from him and were inspired by him or inspired against him. Um, so without any further uh, noise from me, um, uh, being I being the rest and the rest being noise. Um, I want to turn over to you now, um, Alex, to begin and um, perhaps to read something if you would like to from your new book. Um, just tell us, remind us who Wagner was, why he was so important, um, and then hopefully I'd really like to know what you mean by the term Wagnerism. Oh, thank you so much, Catherine. And I think you've done a, a, a far better job summing up my entire book in, in a, a brief space of time than, than I could have done myself. So uh, that's uh, saved me some trouble, but uh, uh, thank you so much for that uh, lovely, lovely introduction. So yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just begin with the very first paragraphs of the book, which I think really convey in a kernel, hopefully, uh, who Wagner was and why his um, impact was so extraordinary. Um, and this opening passage also uh, conveys the, the frame of the book, which is really uh, the aftermath of Wagner, what follows Wagner, not so much uh, his life itself. Only down deep is it trusty and true, false and base is the revelry above. At the end of Das Rheingold, the first part of Richard Wagner's operatic cycle, The Ring of the Nibelung, the gods are entering the newly built palace of Valhalla, and the Rhine maidens are singing in dismay. The river nymphs know that Valhalla rests on a corrupt foundation, its laborers paid in gold extracted from the water's depths. On the evening of February 12, 1883, some three decades after Rheingold was finished and seven years after the ring was first performed complete, Wagner played the Rhine Maiden's Lament on the piano. As he got into bed, he remarked, I am fond of them, these subordinate beings of the deep with their yearning. Wagner was 69 years old and in poor health. Since September 1882, he had been living with his family in a side wing of the Palazzo Vendramin Kalergi, 
on the Grand Canal in Venice. Sequestered in what he called his Blue Grotto, a chamber decorated in multicolored satin fabrics and white lace, he was writing an article entitled On the Womanly in the Human. When it was done, he had said, he would begin composing symphonies. The next day, clad in a pink dressing gown, Wagner continued to work on his essay. In a corner of a blank page, he wrote, nonetheless, the process of the emancipation of women goes ahead only amid ecstatic convulsions. Love, tragedy. Elsewhere in the family suite, Cosima Wagner, the composer's second wife, was playing Schubert's song Lob der Tränen in praise of tears at the piano in an arrangement by her father, Franz Liszt. Sometime after two, Wagner cried out, asking for Cosima and his doctor, Friedrich Kepler. He was found writhing in pain, a hand clutched to his heart. A maid and a valet carried him to a settee next to a window facing the Grand Canal. When the valet tried to remove the gown, something fell to the floor, and Wagner uttered his apparent last words, my watch. At around 3 p.m., Dr. Kepler entered and established that the Meister, the sorcerer of Bayreuth, the creator of the ring, Tristan and Isolde and Parsifal, the man whom Friedrich Nietzsche described as a volcanic eruption of the total undivided artistic capacity of nature itself, whom Thomas Mann called probably the greatest talent in the entire history of art, was dead. So that's where the book begins with Wagner's death. <laughs> and uh, I go on to describe the global ceremony of mourning that ensued as, as the news of Wagner's death uh, went out uh, across the world and uh, an enormous uh, upwelling of whether it was uh, praise or skepticism or condemnation or some mixture of the of, of all those qualities, it, the, the world registered uh, Wagner's death in an extraordinary way. Uh, but then something else begins to happen. After Wagner's death, one might have assumed that he would sort of begin to, to fade back into uh, history, that he would sort of become one of the great composers of the past. But instead, there was this eruption of interest, renewed interest in Wagner, uh, not just in music, but all through the arts. And this is what uh, uh, I've called and many other people have called Wagnerism. The term came into being uh, it, later in his life. Uh, this idea that Wagner was a movement, a tendency, a kind of path uh, for, for other artists to follow, uh, not just in music. And this was a sort of unprecedented phenomenon that a musical figure would become uh, a general artistic uh, phenomenon. Nothing like this had happened before and argu arguably nothing like it uh, has happened uh, since. And the height of it was, um, in what we call the fin de siècle, the, the end of the century, the end of the 19th century, and in the first years of the 20th century. And it seemed as though in this period, there were very few major figures in the arts and, and literature um, and in intellectual life uh, more broadly, uh, politics as well, who didn't have some kind of uh, opinion uh, about Wagner, some kind of stance on Wagner. It just seemed as though you were acquired uh, to, to sort of uh, have a position uh, on Wagner. Uh, and many, many major figures had, had a quite intense uh, relationship with Wagner. And I talk about Thomas Mann, Marcel Proust, uh, James Joyce, uh, Willa Cather, uh, Virginia Woolf, Vasily Kandinsky, many, many others. And so Wagner actually plays an important role in the emergence of what we call modernism. Uh, in the arts. He was seen to be an avant-garde figure uh, and prophetic of these extraordinary breakthroughs in the arts that took place right at the beginning of the 20th century. But at the same time, of course, he was increasingly associated with conservative tendencies in politics. So it's a, it's a very contradictory phenomenon where in some ways it seems to, to sort of move forward and, and sort of uh, expand outward. Uh, and in other ways, it seems to be kind of narrowing, uh, steadily narrowing in, in terms of its, of its influence. And so the complexity of it is, is 
uh, enormous. Uh, the the scope of it uh, is enormous. And this is a long book, uh, mm. and I try to uh, account for as many of these phenomena as as I can. And yet, there's a great deal that I that I left out, and there's much more that could be said. And when you were just talking about uh, uh, light motifs in Bollywood, I immediately thought, oh well, that should have been in there too. I wish I'd talked to you. Uh, and so it can go on and on and on. Uh, but this this is an attempt to to frame this whole question of of what Wagner meant for that period of time, uh, the, 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 uh, the years around 1900, and what he continues to mean in the present, because he remains a very controversial figure, a very unsettled figure, and he still is a figure from whom our artists in other fields take uh, inspiration. And so, so Wagnerism continues uh, today uh, in, in all different ways. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that's really valuable that you've done here is actually to point out the range of Wagnerisms, you know, up to um, the, the 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 Nazi period, when so much of our post forty five memory of Wagnerism is so um, so bound up with that horrific uh, moment, um, and. Um, and it's it's very interesting that it's at this point that we seem to be able to to look back and recover some of these things because of course uh, um, Wagner in many ways was was um, was cancelled in in, in com common parlance by so many people and so many of us still have to grapple with the um, the terrible parts of his legacy. The, uh, the the term I think you use in sacred monster is in so many ways um, a really valuable way of putting it, a really um, iconic way of putting it. Um, and I think one of the things that you do um, so well is that you you point out some of the reasons why his um, appeal was so wide and so complex. And one of those, I think, is the depth of the mythical world that he creates, um, which doesn't just draw us on, on uh, uh, Germanic and, and Norse mythology uh, and, and, and so forth, but actually has a lot of deeper roots. And um, one of the... Um, one of the really interesting things to me, and I think perhaps to the Jaipur audience, is the extent to which um, his ideas were underpinned by philosophers who'd been dealing a lot with Buddhist and Hindu uh, mythology and philosophy. And I was wondering whether you could tell us a little bit more about, about those philosophers and how, and how Buddhist and Hindu philosophy um, uh, came into the mix. I just want to read another uh, little telling quotation from you, which um, where you talk about the philosopher Ernst Bloch, uh, and you say that he handily summarized Parsifal, his last opera, as Christian Buddhist Rosicrucian art religion or religious art. Uh, poised between blinding light, this is you now, poised between blinding light and devouring night, it rose as a supreme enigmatic symbol over the epoch of the fin de siècle, when artists everywhere felt that some revelation was at hand. And I think, you know, this is the appeal that it has such deep and, and wide roots that it can be a revelation for all. So, uh, yeah, we'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, well, of course, uh, Wagner emerged from German Romanticism. Uh, he came along sort of at a somewhat later stage from the classic early phase of, of German Romanticism, but he inherited its legacy. Um, and one remarkable thing about uh, Goethe and, and, and Schiller uh, and, and other German Romantics was their interest in non-Western thought uh, and literature. And, and so uh, Goethe's uh, enthusiasm for, for Persian poetry and, and also in, in German um, intellectual life, uh, the, the, uh, the discipline of so-called Orientalism uh, really uh, took root um, and became more and more widespread. Um, and actually uh, Wagner's brother-in-law, uh, the husband of one of his sisters, uh, Hermann Brockhaus was an important German uh, 
Orientalist who translated uh, Sanskrit and, and Persian. Um, and so at a quite early stage, uh, Wagner would have had exposure uh, to these uh, ideas just in, in family gatherings, but it would have happened anyway in terms of his exposure to German Romantic literature. And then there was Schopenhauer. Um, and famously, uh, Wagner uh, suddenly electrifyingly discovered uh, the philosophy of Schopenhauer in 1854 as he was working on the ring cycle. Uh, and it was an enormous revelation to him and sort of caused a, a general philosophical shift uh, in his thought away from uh, this early post-Hegelian uh, sort of post-revolutionary uh, phase uh, to something more in line with, with Schopenhauer's philosophy of uh, resignation and and renunciation um, and and that I think that particularly comes to the fore in in, in Parsifal, which is a very Schopenhauerian uh, opera. And of course, uh, Schopenhauer was was very acutely uh, interested in the uh, 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 Indian uh, traditions and and East Asian uh, traditions. Uh, you know, not necessarily with with a, a sort of a, a, a very acute and, and exact uh, understanding. It was all kind of filtered through uh, a German sensibility, but nonetheless, it, it was very important uh, to him, to Schopenhauer, and thus uh, to Wagner. So all of that is kind of uh, uh, simmering in Wagner's work, and I think comes uh, more and more to the fore and sort of reaches its its climax in Parsifal, and. Uh, uh, Wagner sort of propagated this idea toward the end of his life that uh, religion, uh, sort of spirituality, could evolve in a way that uh, that it absorbed more and more of uh, of of the different world traditions. Uh, this idea of a syncretic uh, uh, religion or sort of spiritual philosophy that would combine uh, West and East and, and, and also sort of pagan elements. And, so, and that's what Parsifal is. I mean, uh, uh, Parsifal is, you know, it's on the surface, a sort of Christian uh, tale, but but uh, it, it, it also has uh, 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 roots, especially in, in uh, uh, the Buddhist uh, tradition um, and, and some pagan uh, elements as well. Uh, and so that what he was that's what he was striving for later in life, and he, he expounded on this, these ideas somewhat incoherently in, in his uh, later essays. And that impulse in Wagner intersected very, very strongly with these uh, new uh, spiritual and religious ideas which spread in the last years of, of the 19th century, uh, whether it was uh, Rosicrucianism, these other kind of forms of, of occult uh, uh, pursuits, um, especially in France, or whether it was uh, theosophy or anthroposophy and, 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 and various other uh, 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 disciplines. Uh, and, and for all of those groups, you could always find uh, Wagnerians, uh, uh, sort of in, in, in each of those uh, groups. Uh, there were there were enthusiastic Wagnerians. And so it all kind of... Uh, really wells up at the end of the 19th century in, in a fascinating way. And so this is especially the fourth chapter of my book uh, yes. is, is very much focused on that question. Yeah, I wanted to, I, I did actually want to, to, to ask you to kind of take us down that little, that little uh, route into this, um, to sort of the esoteric Wagnerism, um, because, um, because, you know, yes, you, you have these ideas coming through Schopenhauer um, of, you know, connections of Maya, the idea of illusion and of Nirvana, the kind of um, destruction of the self, um, which really does come across in something like uh, an opera like Parsifal. Um, and you can actually see the appeal of an opera like Parsifal, um, despite its ostensibly Christian framing, as you say, to um, to esotericists and occultists and mystics of all kind, um, because of it's it's got all sorts of pagan and extra Christian and fantasy ritual and magic and miracles and so forth in it, um, and. Um, and I just want to read, uh, you know, a, a little bit from the beginning of the chapter because of, of, of this chapter on the esoteric, occult, occult, satanist, theosophist Wagner. Um, 
because it's just such a brilliant dive into the underworld. And you say it was the age of esotericism, occultism, Satanism, spiritism, theosophy, which of course has Indian roots, uh, Swedenborgism, mesmerism, Martinism, and Kabbalism, reinventions or fabrications of medieval sects multiplied, the Knights Templar, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and various Rosicrucian orders, which sought to revive Renaissance alchemical and necromantic lore of obscure origin. Not only fringe gurus, but also denizens of high society were dabbling in seances, tarot cards, astrology, and homeopathy. A large number of writers, artists, and musicians took an interest in one or another of these movements. I'm just wondering whether you have um, a favorite uh, theosophist or, uh, <laughs> or esotericist amongst this uh, cast of extraordinary characters who were Wagnerists. Yeah, well, of course, it's a very diverse melange of people, and 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 you know, uh, some of these characters were 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 very serious, and 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 uh, were were figures who who really built uh, considerable uh, movements. Uh, if you look at Theosophy, if you look at uh, Rudolf Steiner, um, and and so you know, I, I wouldn't want to sort of treat them in in a kind of uh, ironic or sort of uh, amused uh, way, but you know, at the same time, there are some other figures who are who are very eccentric, uh, who are who are more than a little, little bit absurd, you know. And as part of this European, and this is very much a European phenomenon, at the end of the nineteenth century, uh, at the end of a long period of peace um, and industrialization and, and sort of de development uh, of society and urbanization, uh, there was this longing for some other path of life, you know, outside of this, uh, outside of this sort of heavily uh, urban uh, existence. And, and so people were looking to the East, they were sort of looking to, uh, for, for alternative uh, spiritualities uh, to escape a world that it seems uh, uh, to, to have become very, very artificial, uh, very sort of unrooted. Uh, so I think that was sort of uh, behind sort of all of these different uh, phenomena. But I, I do have a couple of favorites, and I have to mention the extraordinary Parisian uh, novelist, uh, uh, impresario, uh, arts presenter, uh, uh, quasi uh, philosopher, and, and self described magus. Uh, Joseph Pelidon, uh, okay. <laughs> uh wrote this sequence of 21 novels, not all of which admittedly I got around to reading, uh, but I read a number of them. And they're extraordinary. They're, they're absolutely wild and over the top and absurd. But they, there is also a kind of, I mean, it's, an, it's another version of romanticism. It's this sort of reaching for the beyond. It's sort of reaching for, for the other, for extraordinary states of being, the sort of Faustian uh, longing to, to break out into, into new spheres. And so that's what Peladon was, was expressing. And then he actually put together these, uh, these uh, art uh, uh, exhibitions uh, under the umbrella of his Rosicrucian order in Paris in the 1890s, which exhibited some, some uh, important uh, symbolist artists. Um, and, and so he wasn't, uh, wasn't all tomfoolery. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I, I did admittedly enjoy myself as I, as I put together this section of, of the book um, because um, it, you don't know, what, what, you know to what extent are you supposed to take it uh, seriously? I mean, it was a kind of performance art, you know, his <laughs> Uh, his magic uh, rituals and, and his sort of pose as as uh, a magus, um, and and so I enjoyed that very much. Um, but I think you know, coming back to the the idea of combining the different traditions and sort of combining the, the sort of various um, uh, sort of bodies of, of of spiritual and religious thought, I think something that Wagner did, which was very important and perhaps is is the most profound enduring idea that he put forward, you know, aside from the, the music itself, which is so extraordinary in his own terms, is his work with myth. And he, he, sort of, he sort of detached the idea of myth from mythology, from, from the sort of the usual bodies of, you know, Greek mythology and, and Roman mythology, which was sort of studied in this, in this antiquarian uh, 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 way. And, and he said, no, um, myth, lives on. Myth is always modern and it's always changing and it's always evolving. And, and he, he looked over these, these various traditions, whether it's Western or Eastern, modern, ancient, and he saw the common patterns behind the mythic stories. And, and there were others who were thinking in this way, uh, but Wagner was, 
was a very significant figure in terms of what we think of as, as uh, a comparative uh, mythology. And later figures, uh, very major authorities such as Claude Lévi-Strauss uh, and also Carl Jung um, uh, hailed, recognized uh, his perspicacity uh, in, in detecting those common elements uh, in the story. And that's what Parsifal is. He's sort of, he's finding uh, a, a common pattern uh, in, in several different uh, mythic uh, and, and religious stories and then kind of, you know, layering them one on top uh, of another. And this, this is a very considerable uh, achievement on Wagner's part. And this is something that really lives on. If we look at our, our mythic stories of today, uh, uh, comic book stories and superhero stories, I mean, we see these same patterns uh, playing out, and sometimes they are they are quite explicitly patterned after Wagner's own versions. Sometimes they more obliquely sort of echo his ideas. But but you know, above all, you know, myth is modern. Uh, it, it 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 lives on um, in in sort of every form of sort of cultural uh, expression, and its roots go very very deep uh, in in human history, beyond history, sort of in, into the into the unrecoverable past. Yeah, it's and 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 incredibly deep and important to society today, which is, you know, his, one of his most brilliant insights. Um, stepping sideways, um, another one of, um, you know, the extraordinary things about Wagner um, and, and another deep thing that was picked up, um, in this case, in American Wagnerism was the importance of landscape. Um, and um, one of the most surprising and interesting chapters uh, in the book um, is the chapter on Willa Cather, um, who, of course, is one of the great American writers of place, um, but also of music and particularly opera. Um, and um, I, I just I just found this this fascinating. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering whether you would like to talk a little bit about her and her um her relationship with with landscape and Wagner's landscape yeah well this is one of my favorite sections of the book and it was actually a a, a voyage of discovery for me um at the beginning of this process which is more than a decade ago I, I knew I'd read some of Cather's work but I I wouldn't have said that she was really kind of central to uh to my kind of uh private literary uh canon um but I knew she was going to be a part of this book because uh she had written an entire novel The Song of the Lark about a Wagnerian soprano and she wrote several other stories um in which uh, Wagner is very much uh, front and center including the early extraordinary story of Wagner matinee but as I as I worked on in the book, I just found myself more and more absorbed in Cather's world. Um, and I, I went to Nebraska to this uh, uh, town where she spent much of her youth, uh, Red Cloud. I went back two more times and, and did some work in the Cather archives in Lincoln, Nebraska, and really fell in love with the place. Um, and met a number of for those of us who've never been to Nebraska. Yeah, well, it's flat, of course. Well, that's your first impression of it, that it's that it's flat, the great wide open American uh, prairie uh, going on and on and on in the big sky. Uh, but actually this area, Red Cloud, it's actually quite um, hilly. There, there's sort of you know, hills and, 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 and gorges. Uh, and, and so it, it undulates. It's a landscape that, that undulates and sort of has its uh, dramatic perspectives. But sort of the basic sense of it is, is this, this huge sky. And we're sort of standing there in the, in the middle of a, of a field. You have the sense of, of sort of, sort of solitude amid grandeur, um, and this was something that that that, that Cather felt as a, as a girl, sort of roaming these these prairies, and it's something I think she immediately uh, identified in Wagner as a sort of the sensation in Wagner being out alone in this huge landscape, um, and I think this happens for a very specific musical reason, because. Mm -hmm. Wagner famously in his operas uh, abandons the usual forms. Uh, you know, he, here is overture, here's a, a, a chorus, a duet, uh, an aria, uh, another chorus and so on and so forth. These very kind of crisp demarcations uh, between kind of uh, musical sections. Wagner uh, uh, sort of blows all that up, uh, uh, really, especially with the, the ring cycle, but it's also, it's already happening in Tannhäuser, Lohengrin, uh, the earlier operas. Uh, and, and instead we sort of enter into this continuous stream of 
sensation and everything is always sort of blending into the next thing, always evolving, perpetual transition. Nothing is ever fixed. Just under Isolde, this opera that begins with a question, a question mark, and, and it's sort of, it isn't resolved really until the very end, harmonically and also kind of uh, in terms of the, the, uh, uh, the story. Um, and so one way of thinking of that sort of continuous stream is as a kind of inward uh, sensation, as a stream of consciousness. Uh, and that's what the, the, the French avant-gardists seized on in Wagner, uh, Baudelaire and Mallarmé and, and Proust and, and uh, uh, outside of France, uh, Joyce and Virginia, Virginia Woolf as well, uh, this kind of inner continuity. But I think for Cather, it was the, the outer continuity of the sort of the infinite landscape uh, and, and, and that is what she loved so much in, in Wagner. And so, and so she repeatedly in her works um, uses Wagnerian analogies against her native landscapes. And then she posits these figures, usually women, not male heroes, but, but uh, uh, female heroic figures, solitary, independent, striving uh, against that, that infinite Wagnerian landscape. And that is really the iconic Cather image from, from O Pioneers and, and My Antonia uh, is, is uh, the, the woman, uh, the self-sufficient woman uh, in the landscape, which was a, a sort of a important kind of proto-feminist uh, mm -hmm. uh, contribution that, 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 that Cather made uh, to literature. She didn't write about women uh, as dependent on a, a male context. She didn't write stories of, of marriage, you know, and sort of, sort of, sort of marital happiness or unhappiness. Uh, sort of her, her women were able to exist outside of those uh, frameworks. Uh, and so Wagner was, was part of that equation for Cather. But I just, uh, this was such a, a, a great, reward of this book is just to sort of go much, much deeper into Cather's world and to have this relationship now with the town and people there. And of course, I hadn't originally planned to have an entire chapter about Cather in my book, but that is what happened. And, and she is actually the only figure in the book who has a chapter unto herself. Yeah, and and as she should, I mean, you know, the, the, this idea of of the pioneer woman. I'm from originally from Australia, and you think about um, mm -hmm. all those women whose men would go off for months droving cattle, and they would be in charge of the homestead in a very very dry environment. Uh, mm -hmm. In in some places in Australia, of course, very flat as well with big skies and so on. And these women were extraordinary really extraordinary and it really is this kind of it's a different kind of modernism and it's a different kind of world on the edge of becoming of, of becoming modern which is just so fascinating in in her writing which you quote uh quite lavishly um in in the book which is just wonderful i i've never read her and i'm now going to because i'm just it's really such an inspiring chapter um but um Thinking, th I mean, thinking about this this stream of American Wagnerism, which is different from the you know the esoteric Wagnerism of the uh, of you know of, of fantasy Europe, and I'm just wondering what you would say Wagnerism is today. Is there a Wagnerism today? Um, and if so, what shapes does it take in your experience? Well, the phenomenon underwent several very important changes uh, in the 20th century, and and, and really, uh, it 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 went into steep decline um, in the 20th century. Um, and it was really the two wars uh, that forever changed the two world wars that forever changed Wagner's image, um, and and made him. Uh, uh, a much less uh, universal figure in his appeal. In the First World War, uh, German came to uh, Wagner came to be identified very strongly with German nationalism, and, and he was sort of used, weaponized um, during the war by uh, uh, German uh, 
uh, intellectual figures as well as military figures as, as a sort of symbol of, of German uh, might. And, and so there was a backlash to that, uh, somewhat understandably, um, in, in other Western European nations uh, and in America, sort of among the, the, uh, the enemy combatants uh, in, in World War I. Wagner was actually banned, more or less banned, um, in uh, America uh, 1917, 1918, after uh, America entered the war. Um, and, and so sort of the, the golden age of Wagnerism was I think over at that point. Uh, uh, Wagner had been nationalized. And, and this kind of seems remarkable in retrospect because we're so used to thinking of, of Wagner as this hyper-national figure, but he really wasn't. At the turn of the century, it was, it was a very cosmopolitan profile that he had and, and really other countries really felt that Wagner was theirs. I mean, French, uh, in the sort of French Wagnerian tradition, he was really felt to be sort of more French than German uh, in, in some ways, and sort of British and, and Americans and, and Spanish and, and uh, Catalan uh, Wagnerians, Italian Wagnerians, and everyone felt that they had, you know, a, a piece of, of Wagner. And I think justly so, because, you know, Wagner did travel all over and he did sort of gather influences from, from all different uh, national uh, traditions. Um, and so people were justified in sort of finding themselves in, in Wagner. But that changed after the First World War. Uh, and then the Second World War, you know, I mean, even, even more importantly, the legacy of Nazi Germany um, and, and Hitler's uh, deep, deep early identification with, with Wagner meant that sort of after 1945, uh, Wagner was equated not only with, with the German nation, uh, but with this extreme uh, right-wing tendency um, in, in German history. And so, you know, Wagnerism today is, is so heavily conditioned by that. And we just bring up Wagner, uh, you know, to sort of, sort of the average person, you know, I find that sort of the, the first reaction is, oh, well, you know, Hitler's favorite composer. I mean, this is kind of the, 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 the one thing that a lot of people know uh, about Wagner. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that, that is how Wagner is defined today. But um, there are many other strands to it. Uh, and sort of these older Wagnerisms uh, uh, kind of continue in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think in film, um, in fantasy culture, and also in, in sort of uh, in, in literary, more conventional literary fields, uh, novels and poetry and, and painting, uh, you, you find Wagner references in the paintings of Anselm Kiefer, um, in the novels of Philip K. Dick and other uh, science fiction uh, writers. Um, and so it goes on, but, but you know, the thing to, that must be contended with now is the association with Hitler, which of course is something I spend a lot of time on in the book, uh, attempting to grapple with it and, and put it in the right context. Yeah, I think you do have to. Well, we are drawing to the end of our time here, which is such a shame. I could, I could talk to you about this forever, I think. Um, but um, if just one very last quick question. Um, having come to the end of this very long journey through all this complexity, what is the one thing that you would take away from what you've learned with this? What, in the end, does Wagner's legacy have to tell us today um, about the relationship between music and aesthetics on the one hand and power on the other? I think what Wagner teaches us is the power and the danger of our tendency to, to worship art, you know, to make uh, a religion uh, of art. And, and, you know, at the turn of the century, uh, Wagner was a kind of god in the, in the cultural arena, and, and people did sort of see him as a, as a vessel through which these sort of, you know, otherworldly and, and, and sort of spiritual forces flowed. Um, and I think this is a, a natural tendency that, that we have as humans uh, to sort of use our art um, as, as this, you know, um, uh, religious iconography. And it's a sort of open question, you know, which came first, sort of the tendency to make images or sort of the, the the sort of you know uh, uh, ideas of, of of gods and and of sort of you know higher presences uh, uh, in our life and and so it's a natural tendency but you know we see in Wagner's case how uh, it becomes enmeshed in in real and dark historical and political forces in a way that is not unique 
to the German case. And so this is something I stress very, very strongly uh, at the end of the book. We cannot take away from this whole episode sort of simply the idea that, that, that something went terribly wrong in Germany, in German history and, and culture. Uh, this is a pattern that keeps recurring um, and I certainly look to, to the American experience uh, and to, uh, to sort of ways in which uh, American culture has been wrapped up in, in, in the American striving after power and how it has been used and, and misused. Uh, and I think sort of every national tradition uh, can learn lessons from uh, this, this tremendous and in many ways horrifying episode of Wagner um, in, in Germany. And at the same time, we can learn from the episode how to, how to grapple with the past uh, in a way that we don't sort of simply dispense with and, and kind of disregard what, mm. what troubles us, uh, because that's, that's not the way to really uh, uh, kind of fundamentally confront these issues. We, we need to be, we need to have an active relationship with a complex uh, and troubling figure like, like Wagner. We need to sort of continue uh, working through it. I mean, for, for one reason, just sort of hold on to what is so valuable and what is so beautiful and powerful in his work, uh, but also to, to understand how sort of everything that we, that we love and everything that we cherish has a dark history behind it, you know, and, and Walter Benjamin's uh, great comment, that there's no document of civilization that is not at the same time a document of barbarism. Uh, Wagner is, is a great illustration of that, but there is an infinite train of other uh, examples in, in cultural history and it's something we must always, always be aware of. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Alex Ross. It's been a pleasure talking to with you about your book, Wagnerism, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's been delightful to, to talk to you. Thank you, Alice and Catherine, for such an outstanding conversation. It was superbly enjoyable. Thank you to our partners, Diageo, for their support. And thank you to all of you for being such a lovely audience. Please do stay logged on to continue to watch with us a series of exciting sessions we have specially curated for you. Also remember to buy your copy of the book from the Amazon online bookstore. As you're aware, the cultural sector has been critically impacted by the pandemic. And while we have braced ourselves to embrace the new normal, we did struggle to ensure that we can continue to bring to you a free flow of knowledge and ideas. We'd love for you to support us at Teamwork Arts. Please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2021 and tag us at Jaipur Lit Fest. The festival is protected by Detol. Hope to see you in our other sessions. To all storytellers and story lovers, my name is Laksh Tata. I host and produce the Jaipur Bites podcast, where you can hear many of the amazing sessions from the Jaipur Literature Festival. I also produce a few other podcasts, as you can see right here. English, Hindi, fiction, non-fiction. If you see something you like, maybe you can take a screenshot of this right now. I'll give you a second. And tune in later. Find them on your favorite podcast app.